Uh, yourself personally, what, what drew you to the bass guitar? Well, it was uh, quite quite by chance. Um, I have been a, I have been a drummer uh, for quite some time, and uh, I uh, was in Arizona uh, hanging out with some friends, and the bass player in this other band uh, moved to uh, San Diego and asked me if I wanted to go along with them. And I said, yeah, okay. So I went back over to San Diego, and I used to go to uh, to this little club uh, where he used to work with his band, and he began teaching me bass at his house. I already knew a little bit about ukulele and stuff, but it's not quite the same thing. But uh, he taught me very little on bass, uh, but enough to get started. And one night, the guitar player didn't show up, at his job and he knew enough guitar to, to pull it off so he handed me the bass and said well you're playing tonight and I'll just tell you what to play so he played guitar and sang and then he would turn to me and tell me tell me what note to play <laughs> and I started playing and I I just have been playing ever since uh, you joined Iron Butterfly in its early days when I believe it was having some, some managerial legal problems what? yes uh, they had done the uh, the Iron Butterfly Heavy album, but it was it was still on the shelf. And uh, I had met Ron Bushy much earlier in San Diego, um, and then I went my way and he went his uh, musically, and we ran into each other again in the summer of 67 in Los Angeles, and um, they were having the problems that you just described, plus the guitar player had quit. And they were, uh, at the time, auditioning guitar players and invited me to come out and meet the guys in the band and stuff. So I did. And I hung out with them for, you know, maybe a month, just, ha you know, going to parties and stuff. And all of a sudden, their bass player and their lead singer quit. Uh, so uh, about two or three weeks later, they were going to audition bass players. And they asked me to audition, and I was the first one, and they gave me the job. You weren't concerned at all about joining a band that was uh, in the middle of a, a legal wrangle? Uh, well, I, to be honest, I had never been involved with uh, uh, a recording band, and uh, I had just been playing clubs and what have you, so I, I don't think I really understood what the problems were, but by the time uh, I, I was officially in the band, which which. September 1967 by Christmas uh, the band had gotten rep representation and uh, the uh, the problem had sorted gotten sorted out and uh, so by the spring of 1968 which is four months later we had done the album that I was involved with which was in a God of Vita and the rest of it just kind of went away now, I guess it would be impossible to talk to anyone from Iron Butterfly without talking about that song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any notions at all when you recorded in the Gutter Vita that it would uh, have the success that it did? Oh, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, <coughs> the song uh, was, I think, just kind of uh, you know, designed to get every uh, the new members of the band into a, into kind of a... Uh, a cohesive musical gel so that uh, everybody could get a feel for how everybody was playing and stuff so uh, originally the, just the lyrics line was written and it was kind of like a, a ballad um, and so we just started playing around with it and uh, of course it changed into a little more heavier rock kind of a situation but the first time we played it live it was only about 12 mi minutes long and it did not contain the drum solo or some other things and as we were doing it in rehearsal this song just kind of seemed to take on a life of its own and um, uh, finally you know we just got into the frame of mind that uh, we were just going to take a musical journey about the life of man from the beginning uh, up until uh and 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 through the uh, birth of Christ, with uh, 
all the animals and everything, you know, and that's how kind of we, what we perceived it as being. Um, and then, uh, when we recorded it and sent it in, uh, along with five or six other songs, at the time we had just gotten our big break by being able to go on the road with Jefferson Airplane. We were opening for them and, uh, while we were on the road, Atlantic Records, actually it was ATCO, uh, called our manager and said that that, that uh, they did not want that long song on there, absolutely not, and we had to cut it down and go record some other songs. And we in turn said, well, there's, n- there's nothing to cut down. It's all uh, a s- symphonic situation, and if you take all that away, there's that's just the lyrics that just repeat themselves. So somehow the manager convinced them to let it go. And with the advent of FM radio at the time, which was, once again, I think just uh, having the song in the right place at the right time, because without FM, it never, we never, it would never receive any airplay. And uh, the rest is kind of history. But we had no idea um, that... um, that anything as, uh, that of this stature was going to happen, and I think, like any band, you know, uh, you never re- can really tell. And, and you may think all of the songs are hit songs, but it really boils down to what the people like. You know, you can be the best band in the world and, and never sell a record because nobody really cares for what you're doing. Looking back now, how do you think you guys coped with the, the sudden fame that, that that it brought upon you? I'm sorry. Looking back now to that time, how do you think you guys coped with the the sudden fame that the, the song brought to you? Well, I, I I think everybody coped pretty well. Um, you know, that was uh, the sixties were a very interesting time with the, uh, you know, the the uh, Vietnam War and all the turmoil at home and all the drugs and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the band did not dabble in some of that, uh, but we we didn't get caught up in. Uh, in, uh, in in any heavy use by any means, and most of the guys had pretty stable lives. And a couple of guys were married and stuff, and and we kept our heads uh, screwed on fairly well. I mean, uh, and plus the fact it just it didn't seem, uh, you know, I don't think we understood what was really going on until about a year and a half after the song was out because we were working so much we were just gone and and we would come home and find out we were big rock stars and the only way we could tell was all of a sudden we were headlining or something like that and then of course you know we started making money have you ever sat down and pondered how how the band's career may have gone without the song i'm sorry had the song never happened have you ever pondered how the band's career may have mapped out uh, well, you know, it's it's hard to say because uh, a lot of people uh, like a lot of the other material. Uh, perhaps uh, in lieu of that, we have maybe had written uh, three or four more songs, uh, one of which of those could have been a hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's that's guessing. Um, I know a lot of people like some of the stuff on the second album. Uh, but by the time the third album came about, we had a, a, a personnel change, and the 60s were gone, and we changed direction a little bit. But <laughs> I don't think uh, it was the right time for Iron Butterfly to do that. And maybe uh, we were just uh, one of those bands that did, did, did the 60s, and, and that's all there was to it. And uh, even though some of the other songs... Uh, were very well received in a guided de vita, if you will, uh, just over, overpowered or overshadowed everything else that was going on. Did it put a lot of pressure on, on the band to, to continue the success? Did you feel the pressure on you? Well, I, I think that was one of the demises of the band was the, the push by management uh, for us to keep working and 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 ergo we didn't have the time to a relax b sit down and and creatively write new songs everything seemed to be hurry up you know you're back off the road for t- two weeks go right into the studio and start writing material uh you know and then and then while you're writing that and recording it go out and play every weekend uh it's just uh perhaps that had something to do with the creative stuff 
Uh, and also, those the, the guys that were married, it was real tough on the families because you're never really home long enough to see what's going on. And I know that uh, when finally when Doug uh, Doug quit uh, after four years, uh, you know, one of the things he was said he, he said he just he hasn't had time to slow down. His children are growing up, and he doesn't feel good about the material he's writing because uh, he, he feels it's rushed. And we were rushed to luck as we worked just all the time. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, looking back now, I, I think that it, the band might have gone on a, a little longer, more creatively, had we had the opportunity to take a real break every now and then rather than two weeks. Mm. Uh, but who's to know? That was then and this is now. How does it feel now to, to see the band labelled a, as a pioneer of heavy metal? Does that sit okay with you guys, or do you think it sort of slots you into one category too much? Well, I, you know, we've heard that connotation. Um, I don't know, uh, I, uh, because some, uh, when when I hear some of the other bands that are, are touted as heavy metal, I think, well, we don't sound anything like them. <laughs> is, it, is it because that... We were one of the bands that were loud. Well, if that's the case, then yeah, we were the heavy metal. But uh, and some of the other bands that are heavy metal, um, they don't play anything like this, and, and nor do we play like them. And uh, so, you know, I, I've never really thought about it. I, and people say, uh, some people have even said, oh, uh, we're the fathers of heavy metal. And I go, well, I don't know how that can be because there were bands out there playing loud rock and roll at the same time we were and probably before so why give that to us mm. you know uh, you know i really don't know i think the only thing special about our music was the the mystical approach um that was on the bright side rather than the dark side yeah because we weren't really uh, involved in any um you know, negative situations. We just, uh, the songs that we wrote were about just regular stuff that happened to us. Now, you toured extensively with some, some legendary bands in those days, and you mentioned a couple before. Do you have a particular favorite tour story from those days? Well, uh, some of the bands that I really, they became my friends were the guys in uh, Three Dog Night, and uh, and the guys in um, CT Chicago, which was the, at the time their debut album was CTA, and uh, the Turtles, and uh, but you know I also in, you know enjoyed uh, although we didn't play too many times together, but we played the same festivals. Uh, Jimi Hendrix before it was the bands of Dipsies. He and I used to ride motorcycles together occasionally when we were both in town at the same time. <laughs> and uh and uh but a lot of the touring that we did you know we played a lot with canned heat the, uh when the, the, they were all together those guys were uh, just a lot of fun we played with so many people but 75 percent or 80 percent of those jobs were these big outdoor three-day festivals so we might have played the f same festival that so and so did, but it might not have been on the same day, and we might not even have seen them. Um, I have met every. We played with everybody but the Beatles because they were touring then, but not exactly at the same time. Uh, I've met and talked with a lot of the people, and uh, but it's just sporadic. It's you meet somebody, hey, how you doing? You see them six months later, or you go, oh yeah, well, how are you guys doing? And that's the end of it. Then you know. Uh, but as far as um, I think my favorites, I, as I say, were uh, Candy Heat and Three Dog in Chicago and uh, and that uh, that era. How was the uh, relationship between the band and the record company? Because Atlantic weren't really a label that had a lot of experience with rock and roll bands, but when you joined them, well, um, I think looking back, I think uh, we were we were. I mean, just just to get a record deal or be part of something that I had never been in personally was uh, a very exciting for me. And then, of course, to be part of a situation that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, made the band get very popular and also made them a great deal of money uh, because that album cost, uh, in those days, uh, $18,000 U.S., 
to make. And and the the artwork is a, a is a, a, a photograph of us playing live at the Fillmore East. So you could imagine how much that cost. Virtually nothing. And it was a staff photographer from them. But to get the attention that we got from you know uh, a record company uh, was was all very nice. But it's also because we were making them a lot of money. And um, and I'm glad that uh, they gave us the opportunity to. To, to do a, a second album and a third album and uh, uh, I, you know we had managers and, and stuff to sort out if there whatever legal problems there were and I don't remember any legal legal hassles coming up until uh, after it was all over you know years later Now the band is back together again after, after for a few years now uh, what was the impetus in, in doing that and getting the band back together? Well, uh, basically, uh, booking agents were calling the record company uh, because the people wanted to hear Iron Butterfly play. So they would, in turn, call our attorney, and uh, the attorney would call me or somebody in the band, but more often than not me, and uh, say, listen, these people want want you guys to play. You want to do it? And I said, well, yeah, that sounds like fun, but... Um, I don't know if you know if every, if I can get everybody together, you know. So uh, that's how it started, and since since that started, there have been various original members, if you will, in the band, uh, based upon you know their personal lifestyles at the time. But for the past fifteen years, uh, Ron Bushy and I have been doing it, uh, and very consistently, and. Uh, and then Doug rejoined the band for about three or four years, but had family problems, um, a couple a death in the family, and and he's also taking care of his mom and stuff, and and he has a situation that he just couldn't be out on the road anymore, so uh, he had to quit. But we're on the road. We've just come back from Europe and uh, in the spring, and we've been touring this summer, and I think we're going to go back uh, in the fall. And we certainly would love to come to Australia sometime. We've never been there. Oh, we'd love to see it. Completely. Were, were there any concerns when you did get the band back together that you may not be able to re- recapture what you once had? Were you worried at all about that? No, because uh, what we did was we just played the original songs, uh, you know, 90% accurately because it's it's 25 years later and we play a little bit different. And, you know, I've been involved musically myself and have grown. And, and, and then with you get new members, you get a different take on it and what have you. We've tried to be as faithful as we could, but we also like to have fun as musicians and just, you know, relax and have a good time. And that's what the people like to see us do is having fun playing our music for them. And we've written some new things, in which when we're on the road, we, we play them a couple of times. It just depends on how much time we are given to play. Sometimes they give us an hour and a half. Sometimes they give us 30 minutes. So we don't really... When we have more time, we put a couple of new songs in. When we have 30 minutes, it's like three songs and in a guided to via and see you later. <laughs> <laughs> are there any plans at all to record the new material? Yes, uh, we are working on um, an internet project right now, uh, and it probably won't be ready till next spring because we have to go back to Europe for six weeks, and that'll kind of s- slow down the recording. Uh, and there may be a new version of Inagata de Vida because uh, people have been inter- uh, asking about that. And we've got four or five, six songs um, already on tape. They're, you know, they're eighty percent there, and we want to write about. Then record about six more, and then look at all of it and see, you know, because not not every everybody can make the team, if you will, mm-hmm. and and so we want to make sure that we select the right songs that is really where this band is right now, you know, rather than a hodgepodge of different things where it does it doesn't seem like it's the band is cohesive in the direction, and so that's why we're going to write more than we need just to kind of see where it all winds up listeners here what what is the actual current lineup of the band as it stands today okay it's uh myself on bass and vocals ron bushy on drums eric barnett on lead vocals and guitar and um 
My mind is a blank right now. Larry Rust, R-U-S-T, on vocals and keyboards. And what would be the extent of your, of your live work? How much of the year would you spend on the road now? I'm sorry? What would be the extent of your, of your live work and your touring? How much of the year would you spend on the road? Well, uh, we like to tour. Uh, Ron likes to play. I like to play. Eric likes to play. And, and Larry, uh, he, he wants to do it. Uh, he's got his own studio. He does some uh, work for some of the studios around here. Uh, but he uh, could put that on the back burner uh, to do this. So it, it really is. Uh, we're looking to get something out via this Internet. And also it may turn into an actual disc. Uh, I know that... Uh, Every time we go to Europe, we get solicited by a couple of people. And the last time we were, when we were in New York, uh, Atlantic came to see us and, and uh, said, listen, you know, um, anytime you guys want to put something out, give us a call. And, and of course, we just say, well, thank you. Uh, we're not quite ready yet, uh, but when we are, uh, then we'll give you a call. So that th there is some interest there. And I think that if Iron Butterfly put out new product, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know if it would ever achieve the status that it was before, but I think that a lot of our fans that are out there, because we have quite a large fan base via the internet, uh, and, and, uh, and when we go play, we go down very well, uh, and the young kids come to see us, and they know some of the songs probably from hanging around with their parents, <laughs> but, uh, but they buy the albums that we still sell albums, and, and they bring them, and we autograph them, so I, I think that, uh, that just the fact that we do fairly well in record sales and we're a touring band already and it's a good band, uh, we'll, we'll get more work. Apart from experience, of course, what else do you think that the band today has, that the qualities of the band today has that perhaps it didn't have in, in say, 68? Well, it's, gosh, it's the qualities, uh, I think, are... The, the the musicians, especially the two music new musicians, are bringing some more life to the band, new life to the band. They're both very accomplished musicians, and uh, myself, as I said earlier, I have been in never re really out of the business. I did a, a a project after Iron Butterfly, Captain Beyond, the jazz rock band, and and I've produced other bands. Um, I usually produce demos for some of the studios, but. Uh, it's, it's just the fact that I think everybody is so aggressive in their playing and wanting to go and everybody's real professional everybody's through with all of their uh, whatever problems they had in the past with anything, any substance abuse if you will uh, and this is their chosen field of, of life so they're real good at it. so when we get together it's just really easy to do things you know the recording is real easy everybody knows what's going on everybody pays attention and when it does when it happens like that you get a lot more done and it's a lot more fun and that's the key to what we're doing is we're having fun doing something we like to do if we didn't have any fun i don't think we'd be doing it absolutely and just, just to finish up, Lee, if there was one particular thing you'd like to see Iron Butterfly remembered for, what would it be? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Get a guy to DeVita, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, well, I, I guess al along with that would be one of the longest uh, songs, rock and roll songs in history. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's the longest, but it certainly uh, ranks up there. And, yeah. uh, and one thing, uh, that did happen to us in our career, which I don't think that we would be known for, but we may be in the, in the RIAA uh, archives is that, uh, we, we were the band that the Platinum Album Award was created for. That's right, yeah. And, and Ahmed Erdogan put that together with RIAA in New York. And, um, but as far as like the people, you know, the fans, they, I don't know that they would know that or, or that they would even care. <laughs> I think it's pretty much that the Iron Butterfly is synonymous with in a, in a guy to the Vita and the 60s. Kind of like a lot of people say, well, that was, that was my anthem. 
<laughs> you know, uh, but but see, there was also, I mean, we were there, I, you know, Doors Light My Fire was a long song. I mean, it was a very popular song, mm -hmm. you know, and there was a lot of uh, long songs that were, uh, that were popular songs, you know. We weren't the only ones, but we just, that seemed a certain, take on a certain context of its own, you know, if you will. Okay, Lee, look, thank you so much for your time uh, today. I really appreciated that. And, okay. Uh, it's been a treat speaking with you. Okay, well, I'm glad you called, and uh, and it was nice talking to uh, everybody in Australia, and maybe somebody will hear this and, uh, and track us down, because we would love to come and play. Yeah, we'll have to get something happening there. We'd love to see you down here. That, There's a that crowd. Would be, that, that would be great. Um, you know, any time... Let's. We can always figure out a way to do it. If if, if people want us to come down there, and and uh, all we got to do is find a local promoter. Yep, I'm sure there's a, an audience here ready and waiting, and I'll try and get some promoter information over to you too. Okay, that'd be great. Fantastic. Well, you have you have a a good day. Have you been up all night, or are you just getting up and starting here? And <laughs> I no, just got here. Okay. Well, you have a good rest of the day. Terrific. Thanks a lot, Lee. Okay. Bye. All the best. Bye bye.